So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As I say, thank you very much for, for taking time out of your day to join us um, on this webinar. Um, this is the first in our 2015 series of the journey to, uh, to UC. And we're going to, we have a series of uh, webinars uh, over the next couple of months, which are looking at different aspects of the journey, um, ranging from the very beginning where you're looking to evaluate um, justify and perhaps think about moving towards uh, Skype for Business or even a, a more generic link. Perhaps you've already got link in place um, and you're looking to try and develop it further. Right the way through to, to designing and planning uh, adoption strategies, which is our next session. Um, and then at the end, we will, we will look at how you can enhance and extend the value um, of your investment. Today, though, um, we are looking at Skype for Business. And broadly speaking, we will be covering uh, a number of different aspects. We will take a look at Skype for Business and what the changes are compared to Link. Um, we will also look at the deployment options you have, uh, followed by some top tips. Um, your speaker today, um, I'm sure many of you have probably know of Tom. Um, he is uh, a master, a Microsoft master for Skype for Business and Link, as well as an MVP. Um, he does a lot in the community, a lot of speaking, uh, and has a great deal of knowledge. Um, he runs the uh, London User Group, um, so he's pretty well placed to give you a good understanding. He's also been part of the uh, TAP program uh, for Skype for Business, so has had a lot of insight into how the product has developed. So I'm sure you don't want to listen to me any anymore. Let me hand you over to Tom, who will give you the bones of the story. Great, thanks Ian. Hi everybody, thanks Thanks for joining. Thanks for uh, giving your last hour of your day up for a lot of you in the UK. Um, as, as Ian said, we're gonna be going over um, quite a few things in this webinar. We're looking at about 40 minutes and then questions at the end. Um, if you ping in your questions as you go, uh, we'll line them up towards the end. So agenda wise, um, this is the question, the first question that was on everybody's lips since the Skype for Business news. What does it actually mean uh, in terms of going from Link to Skype for Business? What's the changes and what does it mean to you in terms of deployment? Uh, once we've covered that, we're going to go through options for replacing your PBX. Um, and then we're going to go through kind of top five end user considerations and top five technical considerations. So what does the, the change from Link to Skype for Business mean? I was at UC Expo uh, last week, and this was the question that kept coming up as kind of the number one question on everybody's lips. The, the answer is, kind of the non-glamorous marketing answer, is it's, it's very much still Link under the covers. Um, it's, it's built on Link is the marketing term, but essentially it's a revision of Link. So it's very much a rebrand. So this is, this is good news. Everything from a server infrastructure perspective, everything you know about deploying Link 2010 or 2013 basically applies to Skype for Business. It's not a radical change in terms of infrastructure. It's not a radical change in terms of deployment, in terms of management. So all the, all the lessons learned around the, the various global Link 2013 deployments apply to Skype for Business. Uh, it's it's rebranding of a proven platform. So in terms of actual referenceability and is it ready for your business, based on being on the tap, I can say that we've deployed live users on quite a few people and it's still um, still been up to the test of running live production users. And as we see the, the general availability of, of server, which is due relatively soon, we uh, should see a product that can be pretty much ready to deploy uh, early on. It, it's definitely not Skype consumer, and, and this is going to be the biggest task around this version of the product, is understanding uh, end users and infrastructure and business understanding that Skype for Business is a separate, distinct product to what we know as kind of Skype today, Skype consumer. Um, it's different clients, different server, or different online experience. In terms of feature set, very similar and increasingly coming together. Um, but in terms of once you want security and you want archiving and you want policy and you want corporate control, 
that's what Skype for Business brings you. Um, there will be some complexity during the transition. This is a rebrand. So at the moment, we have 2013 server and Skype for Business clients. We've got 2013 mobile clients. We've got Skype for Business desktop clients. So there's, there's an important aspect to this of educating your business and your end users as to what's happening during the transition. Um, but ultimately, I think this is a really positive step. I've, I've spent so long saying, what do I do? Oh, I do basically Skype for enterprise, Skype for business. Uh, and that's how you know, at people outside our UC sphere understand what I do very quickly. Uh, and now it's nice to finally say, no, it is Skype for business because everybody gets that. And I think from end user perspective, when you say Skype, by and large, they understand, oh, I can do voice, I can do video, I can share my desktop. Um, I can do it over the internet, I can do it on a mobile. So I think long term, a uh, positive step in terms of branding, but be aware that during the transition, uh, you're going to have to do some work in terms of your own education in terms of what's in, in which product, but also particularly for your business and your users. So I just wanted to take a minute to talk about what's really changed, which is the user experience. So this is the most important change. The, the current 2013 client has a patch, a cumulative update, which gives you an option to run in a Skype for Business mode, a Skype for Business skin, if you like. And what's on screen now is the experience in that skin. So those of you that run Link 2013 will, will know this experience. Uh, you can see that the users are in a similar place, the kind of contact buttons are in a similar place, but all the iconography and the, the pictures are all based on Skype. So the idea is, is it's, it's familiar to Link 2013 users, but it's also familiar to kind of a, a Skype consumer type experience. And in the Skype skin mode, there are a few, few additions in terms of user experience. So there's now a, a call monitor window, which you can see in the top right. So when you minimize your, your call or your session, you still have this floating call monitor, which tells you that you're in call. And if you're on a video, it shows the remote participant video. Uh, and also there's some simplifications to the dial pad experience. So in the bottom right, now when you're in a call, it's one click to get to the dial pad and one click to get to the transfer button. Microsoft has gone away from the hover menus and back towards a kind of traditional click type buttons or touch buttons. Um, and these work much better on the more common now hybrid devices and touch laptops and tablets. So that's a, that's a high level overview of, of what's changed. Uh, and certainly more is the same than, than what's changed, which I think is a good thing in terms of deployment. So let's dive into what your options are around replacing your PBX. Um, replacing your PBX is obviously an evocative term in terms of what to do, but re realistically, this might be migrating away from your PBX or running alongside your PBX. So there's three kind of high level deployment models. There's public cloud or what we all refer to really as Office 365 typically. And that's either Office 365 or it could equally be a hosting partner. But this is a generally what we consider a multi-tenant environment. So one big environment that you can sign up for per user for your Skype for Business service. Then there's private cloud. Uh, now this is kind of the new trendy term for traditional on-premise servers. But essentially this is either running on-premise or potentially a managed service partner running what we would call the on-premise server product, but as a service for you. So we could deploy or a partner could deploy a Skype for Business server farm, but in a hosted data center and provide you as a complete service. Or equally, you could go the more traditional route and have the servers running in your own data center. Finally, we've got the hybrid model. So in the hybrid model, we, we combine those two basically. We can have some users running in public cloud, Office 365 are hosted, and some users running in private cloud. So let's dig into what the differences are between those models. Firstly, we'll look at Office 365 or public cloud. 
So this is this is certainly a, a front runner in terms of what Microsoft are talking about these days. It, there are some really nice upsides to this model. Um, it's subscription paced. There's nothing really to deploy in terms of hardware or infrastructure. You, you turn up with your credit card or your corporate agreement and sign your users in and, and you're off to the races basically. Um, it, it's a very low admin overhead. It's a very low maintenance overhead. Um, but along with those benefits, there are some, some limitations. But the most important one today is there's no enterprise voice. So enterprise voice is Microsoft's term for PSDN voice. So essentially, if you want a real phone number and to use Skype for Business as your primary phone, uh, you can't do that in Office 365 today. Some, some hosted public cloud providers might provide you with that functionality. It changes from provider to provider. Um, but even the ones that do have limitations on that ability. So you wouldn't necessarily expect to have things like response groups or advanced voice functionality. There's typically no quality of service or ability to guarantee the experience um, because you're running over an internet connection and there's no ability to customize the service. So you're, you're running on a shared service. You can't add third party products for recording or compliance or switchboard or dashboards or monitoring or anything like that. Um, similarly, your administration ability is limited. On Office 365, Skype for Business Online, you have a certain set of policies to choose from, and you either choose policy A or policy B. You can't create your own individual customized policies. Uh, there's quite a selection covering most scenarios, but it's just not as customizable as, as Skype for Business Server. Um, the good news is there's an ability to move from one to the other. So we see Office 365 as a typical um, starting point for a lot of uh, Skype for Business customers uh, who then move into a, a full link or Skype for Business server uh, feature set. But also Microsoft are moving along with their feature set in the cloud. So they certainly have plans for providing enterprise voice and, and all the other feature set in the cloud in the future. Uh, if you're interested in that, there is a kind of committed roadmap, both kind of public and NDA. Um, we can hook you up uh, after the session with the relevant Microsoft people to talk to. A lot of that is still NDA, so we can't really share it on this webinar. It is coming, but today it's not really there yet. So that's a summary of kind of your public cloud Office 365 options. Let's move into private cloud. Private cloud is, is on-prem server, I would call it. This is you have the servers deployed in your data center or in a partner-hosted data center. It's, it's dedicated to you. It's your infrastructure. And it it's, gives you the advantages of having it as your own infrastructure. So now you have the full Skype for Business feature set in this model. It can be your full phone system instead of a PBX or alongside a PBX. You can do any kind of third party integration you need to do. So if you have instant messaging compliance requirements, you could put a compliance product in. If you have audio and video recording requirements, you can put those products in in place. If you have specific reporting or dashboard requirements, again, this is your server with full access to all the APIs and all the integrations and, and fully customizable to your environment. So lots of benefits in terms of features and functionality, but obviously you or a partner is deploying this infrastructure dedicated to you. So typically more of an upfront cost and more of an investment. I just want to go through a, a quick example of a, a private cloud topology to give you an idea of, of what we'd be looking at. So here we can see a very small topology and then a more typical topology. This webinar, we're not going to get into the kind of nuts and bolts of all the, the techie feeds and speeds, but this just gives you some idea of, of how this scales. So on the left, we have a really basic topology, a single server, a single SQL server, and a single Office web app server. And this is the minimum you need to get Skype for Business going or Link going, basically. That's not highly available. That's 
one server and one data center. If you're doing a bit of instant messaging and presence and a bit of conferencing, then that might start you off nicely. More, more commonly is the infrastructure on, on the right. So here we have our service spread across two data centers. They're running in a, an active active pool pairing manner. We have users spread across both of them. We have multiple servers in pools, so we can afford to lose a single server. We can afford to lose an entire data center and we still can give users full service. And if you're providing Skype for Business as a telephony replacement, the model on the right is the more typical model you'd use. Now that's a potential starting point in terms of number of servers and infrastructure, and those link front end pools can scale up to anywhere between kind of eight, 10, 12 front end servers at the high end. And then you can have multiple pools in multiple regions around the world. So compared to the kind of public cloud model, you or your partner is taking on a lot more in terms of infrastructure. But with all the customization to the exact requirements you have and all the ability to integrate various third party products. And critically for, for us in this webinar, these are the models where we can connect Skype for Business or Link up to your PBX and allow voice to flow between the two systems. So that gives us an overview of the private cloud topologies. Now we'll move on to hybrid. Hybrid is, is pretty easy, really. We won't spend too long on it. Um, it's just the fact that both these types of environments can work together seamlessly. So I can start off in Office 365, say I've got a global company and I want to run 80,000 people on Office 365, but in a particular region, EMEA, UK, America, whatever, I, I'm more ready to get rid of my PBX, so I want to run Enterprise Voice with on-prem servers or with a managed partner um, in that region, but run Office 365 for the rest of the world. We can do that. Microsoft and their Office 365 and other hosting providers can connect their environment to the on-prem server environment. You can run the same SIP domain, so essentially to the users it looks like you're the same company, same address book, but you have the ability to mix users between Office 365 or hosted and on-prem. And this is something we're seeing happen increasingly uh, commonly. Also, we can mix between Office 365 for other feature sets. So you might have Office 365 for Exchange and Exchange Unified Messaging, which is the voicemail for Skype for Business, and still have Skype for Business on-prem. And that works perfectly well as well. M more and more we're seeing large chunks of Exchange, uh, email go to Office 365 or hosted, um, but we quite often still see Skype for Business on-prem mainly due to the PBX integration and the ability to do quality of service and call admission control and the other advanced voice features. So rest assured you can to some extent mix and match those two environments to meet your business requirements. Okay, so that's a whistle stop tour of the, the three types of environment you need to be thinking about that you could deploy Skype for business with. Now we'll move on to the different options for PBX integration or replacement. Again, here we have three high level options. So what we can do is we can place a gateway, which is a, an appliance from a third party vendor certified by Microsoft that integrates the Skype for Business servers with the on-prem PBX. This integration could be via SIP or it could be via ISDN. SIP being an IP protocol, so there's no um, proprietary kind of network or cabling, it's just TCP IC, IP over a network, and ISDN being a kind of a standards-based telephony integration where we use a, an ISDN-specific cable and ports to connect the PBX to the gateway, and then it talks SIP from the gateway to Skype for Business. So the first model we have is downstream. This is an easy, easy model for us in terms of integration to the PBX. The PBX is sort of the master of the environment and the, the carrier connectivity, so B 
BT or Colt or Verizon, whoever it is, connect directly to the um, PBX and we sit below the PBX. So PBX is the master, we're a slave, the PBX sends a subset of users to us. Then uh, we then get those calls, those go to the Skype for Business server and outbound, our calls go from the Skype for Business server to our media gateways to the PBX and to the PSDN. This is nice to start off with because we can't really negatively impact the PBX. So if we're starting a trial or doing a few hundred users, we can connect downstream without any risk to the, the PBX environment and still get voice calls from PBX users to Skype business users and Skype to PBX and Skype to PSDN and PSDN to Skype. However, it, it does mean the Skype for business infrastructure is somewhat at the mercy of the PBX guys. So it's a bit of a black box that our calls go through. Then the other model um, kind of flips that on its head and that's upstream gateways. So in upstream gateways, the, the media gateways become the authority, if you like. They sit in front of the PBX between the carrier and the PBX. So in this model, the gateway becomes the authority and it chooses if the call goes to the PBX or to Skype for Business. And it could still be that the majority of the users are on the PBX to start off with only a subset are on Skype for Business. It could also be that the media gateways actually make a decision in real time and look at the users to see if they're enabled for Skype for Business. If they are, it goes to Skype for Business. If they're not, it goes to the PBX. And finally, we can even fork the calls. So for a period of time, or even indefinitely, but typically for a period of time, I might have my inbound call forked. So it rings on Skype for Business and it rings on the PBX. From, from my point of view as a kind of deployment consultant, this is my preferred model because I have the control. I can see the calls going in and out through the PBX and through Skype for Business. There's no black box for me because I can see the call end to end and I can change the, the routing as we migrate users. So one day someone is on the PBX and if it's a, you know, typically a Friday night or a weekend migration, I can move another 100 users to be routing towards the Skype for Business. It really does give us a lot more flexibility than the downstream model, but the PBX guys have to be on board with the fact we put those gateways in place. So finally, we have the, the Big Bang or the carrier migration model. Uh, this, is, this is also the end state if you're fully migrating and removing your PBX. So here, we still have the media gateways that live between us and the carrier, but rather than having the PBX in line, either upstream or downstream, we just build this environment in parallel. And this is what we do if we want to go big bang. So Friday night, everybody's on the PBX. We build this in parallel, we test it, and then we move the numbers on the carrier or move the gateways in place of where the PBX was to where the carrier is, and all our numbers come Monday flow into Skype for Business. Not, not that unusual for kind of one or 200 users. We might just go for this. It saves all the, all the interop, all the testing, makes the migration quick. Um, obviously, you have to be ready for those migrated users in terms of training and experience and, and do extensive testing during the migration. This model can also be set up to uh, migrate people in a, in a carrier model. So have BT migrate the users between the PBX and the uh, media gateways, and they can migrate them in batches of 10 or 50 or 100 from one system to the other. So now we've got a, a high level idea of our topology options and a high level idea of how we integrate with the PBX. Let's move on to the top five end user considerations. We put end user considerations first and that's quite deliberate because without the end users bought in and the business bought in, you're not going to have a successful project. So number one is business user buy-in. And this, this really is number one. Your job 
is to improve the life of the business users. If you weren't doing that or we're not doing that, then kind of what's the point? Why would you move from one platform to another? To get the businesses on board, you have to work work with them, ensure you've got the right business sponsorship at the right levels. Uh, there will be a cultural change. There's no getting away from that, particularly people who are communications heavy or phone heavy users. Link or Skype for Business is going to be a new way of working for them. So accept that and, and support that cultural change early. Lots of lots of engagement with users, lots of workshops, lots of customized training. Um, and we'll go through various models of training you can go through. But think about how this is not just a, a replacement of an exchange server. And one day they have Exchange 2010 and the next day they've got Exchange 2013. You're literally impacting the way these people work. And make sure you gather success. Uh, oh, sorry, gather a measure success and gather stories and feedback. Nothing kind of works better than measuring success and sharing it through the business and, and measuring it both to measure your success, but also to measure where you can improve. Usually these, these rollouts are multi-week or multi-month, depending on the scale, multi-country. There's plenty of opportunity for kind of a continuous improvement approach to making sure that you're giving the business what they require. Next, we move on to business policy decisions. These, these tie tightly in with getting the business buy-in. Link or Skype for Business is going to give the business a lot of new features, a lot of new abilities. It's going to change the way they work. But you might also be enabling new features and functionality that previously the business haven't had, so haven't thought about. So just because you enable work from home, are you indirectly saying that everybody can work from home? If you're enabling working from a mobile device, are, are the business agreed that all the workers are allowed to work from mobile devices? Um, and more often federation, so the ability for business to business communications over instant messaging, voice and video, and federation to public networks such as Skype are big questions for business. This, this enables a whole bunch of functionality and, and I believe a whole bunch of value, but other business bought into the fact that they can now IM directly between their, their customers, their suppliers, their competitors. Does everybody understand the impact of that in terms of archiving and monitoring and who's allowed to do it and who's not? Important questions to our, get answers to early and in really important questions that you want to make sure you bottomed out before you give the users the feature. Often, unfortunately, the default answer is no, because that's the safe answer, but really try hard to push through that and say, well, why is the answer no? You know, if we monitor it, if we federate it, if we can turn it on and off on a per user basis, is there some way we can get to yes for these features? Because every feature you can enable gives the user more ability, which drives the, the productivity and the business improvements. So we've talked a little bit about business buy-in and about business policy changes. Now we're going to jump on to mapping and user requirements. This, this can be a, a big job or a small job, depending on the, the scale of the deployment. It, it really involves some kind of consulting or BA engagement to understand what type of users you have, and there will be different ones in different types of business, and what requirements they have. The more you're leaning towards a quick migration away from a PBX or a traditional phone to a, a Skype for Business environment, the more emphasis you should put on this. Knowledge workers, they're kind of easy to be honest. Their Skype for Business fits them really well. They're, they're moving around, they're screen sharing. That's a real sweet spot. Um, similar for back office, but they might have some different requirements. Road warrior and mobile, again, generally we're, we're a good fit there. Where you want to put some real time in is executive users, um, operators, reception desks, anyone that the phone is their kind of primary tool and they use it in a very traditional way, or they have some kind of proprietary add-on to the phone, so contact center or attendant console. Uh, all these requirements can easily be 
provided either through Skype for Business or often through third party providers that are certified for Skype for Business. But you want to be having those conversations and those requirements gatherings nice and early to make sure you're covered. Uh, think in particular about any legal requirements, so PCI compliance, IM, voice and video recording. Uh, those are key things to cover off early because they might have impact on your deployment model and topology. And make sure that all the other processes around the business are supported in your new Skype for Business environment. So now we'll move on to endpoints. Um, this is kind of a, uh, a subset or an extension of user profiling. Endpoints vary greatly in quality and cost. You can spend £30, you can spend £250. Um, and in, in some cases, the, the £30, £50 headset might be the sweet spot. And in other cases, you might want to go higher for, say, a more advanced decked headset or a multifunction headset. Don't, don't try and be unrealistic about savings here is, is my main point. We see lots of people doing big deployments. They spend hundreds of pounds on their proprietary IP phones and they see the cost of headsets and they're like, great, 30 pounds times 10,000 users means I'm saving a shed load of money here or I can sell my IP phones and still make a profit and buy headsets. The kind of the headset is the rubber meets the road for, for Skype business users. So you don't want to be necessarily buying the, the cheapest headset you can. You want to be thinking about the right requirements for the right user. If, if people are using this all day, every day, make sure you get them the right tool for the job. In terms of areas to consider, think about qualified endpoints. So Microsoft run a certification program for endpoints. And think about whether they want IP phones or headsets, Bluetooth or DECT. Um, the biggest advice is get a few options, talk to the vendors, test them out, make sure you're comfortable, certainly test things before you're you're deploying them at scale. End user training and support. This is the the big one of the, the business requirements. I think I find myself saying that on every slide. I'm not sure how I prioritize these, but this is this is where you kind of get success or failure in terms of a Skype for business deployment. Don't don't ignore user training and don't fall into the trap that everybody will just pick this up or it's easy or it's obvious. It it is built to be as easy as possible and as obvious as possible, and it's all built to be discoverable. But bear in mind, in your business, you're going to have people with various IT abilities, uh, various levels of keenness to learn a new tool, to, to get involved. And, and you have to support all those users, not just the ones that are kind of IT savvy, super keen, already know how to use Skype, so make the easy transition. Um, don't, don't train, try and train all the users on every feature in one go. It doesn't work. You, you need to think about what your users' ability are and either start off with the basics or try and schedule classes or training programs or videos that are appropriate to the users and, and revisit a few times. Uh, the level of times will depend on how much engagement you can get from the business and how much their appetite is for learning the, the new features and functionality. But we find if you spread out the training and have multiple sessions and have different levels of sessions and different levels of focus, you get much more engagement than trying to get everybody to a 40 minute session to try and teach them everything about Skype for business in one go. And good, good supports and, and user training is the difference between complete failure, okay, and great. With all, with all the training in the world, a subset of users just won't turn up probably. Uh, and will rely heavily on support. And even those that turn up to all the training will still want to know the support is there or want to be able to reach out. Floor walking, particularly in the early days, is really, really strong. Um, but also two weeks later, three weeks later, is when people get all the basics and then want to do their first conference or their first external meeting or their first federation. This, this really is a specialist skill set. I'm not a person that... It's probably the best person in the world to ask hundreds and hundreds of questions about the, the end user client. But fortunately, there are people out there who are real experts in this area and, and take the time to train users and make them feel kind of happy to ask, to ask lots of questions. And, and that, that in itself is a big feature set. You want to find trainers and floor walkers that really 
want the users to succeed and have the patience to take them through every feature and functionality that they require. So that's, that's an overview of the business end user considerations. Now we're going to dive into some of the more technical considerations. These are equally important, I guess, as the business uh, conversations. But to me, these are all somewhat solved problems. So this is stuff that Modality and, uh, and other people do day in, day out. This is just to give you an idea of what you need to be thinking about. So first one is Skype for Business depends on a really solid infrastructure. It's a, a, a voice over IP, video over IP, conferencing over IP type technology. It requires an underlying infrastructure that's ready to support voice and video, basically. You can't, as a, a Skype for Business deployment team, pass the buck, unfortunately. Users don't care that it's not a link issue or a Skype business issue. It's a network issue. It's a harbor load balancer issue. It's a firewall issue. It's all linked to them. So they need to know that they're going to have a good call each and every time. Or if they're working from Starbucks or from home, at least educate them to the, the variables that are at play and how they can test the call before doing one for real or how they can maximize their connectivity by connecting to a wired rather than wireless, for example. So some dependencies to consider. Exchange unified messaging. Funnily enough, this often doesn't come up at the start of a project. Exchange is a separate product, but it provides the voicemail for Skype for Business. So you need to be working closely with the Exchange team or Exchange Online if you're using Office 365. You can't really have link without Exchange Unified Messaging, in my opinion. People generally want voicemail and missed call alerts. Network, very, very important one. Uh, bandwidth, quality of service, call admission control, power over Ethernet. There's lots to consider here to make sure Skype for Business works. Loads of really tried and tested approaches in terms of doing audits and mathematical models around sizing and scaling, um, but also think about how you're going to test and monitor. Wireless, this presents its own challenges. Again, it's a solvable problem, but possibly a more expensive one to solve. But I think it becomes increasingly important in an age where we're using iPads and tablets and laptops without Ethernet ports. You can't really avoid wireless anymore or say people have to be wired in. They, they need to be able to use wireless. And desktop client rollout. Don't forget that. Someone needs to be rolling out the client and patching the client, and that could make or break the success of your project. Next, we'll move on to third-party components. So, as, as most of you may know, Link is a, or Skype for Business, I keep using it interchangeably, is an ecosystem. Microsoft have open partner programs and people can certify to be compliant to work with Skype for Business. Uh, inevitably, there'll be some third-party add-ons or products that will be part of your solution. Gateways in nearly all of them, room-based video, call recording, contact center operator consoles, there's a whole bunch. Be aware that you need to think about those third parties as part of your whole UC solution. They have their own support models, their own infrastructure, their own requirements. So make sure when you're looking at your solution that you're considering the third parties you need and, and how they fit into your overall UC model. Lots and lots of Microsoft qualified options here. Um, investigate and test think about support models and, and talk to people who have used them and make sure you've got some references. High availability and disaster recovery. Uh, unfortunately, we see this kind of skipped quite a lot or people have a plan, but they don't test the plan. You're replacing typically critical telephony infrastructure here. So you need to think about always being available. There'll be SLAs to meet, there'll be requirements, Think about not just your immediate service and your servers, but the dependencies you have in terms of a, a platform. So if you're dependent on the, the virtualization platform, what's the SLA on that? If you're dependent on the network, what's the SLA on that? And it might be that those are less than you want for your service, and you have to think about are those acceptable business risks, or do you need to kind of bulk up or improve in those areas? 
three areas that are often overlooked, um, inbound and outbound rerouting from a carrier, branch sites and certificates. They're the ones time and time again we see people miss, so be sure to look out for those. Support and lifecycle management. So this is this really brings it all together for me. How are you going to support Link and Skype for Business in an ongoing basis? This is not a kind of fire and forget type scenario. It's a constant life cycle. You deploy, but after you deploy, you need to patch. You deploy in one region, then you need to deploy in another. Um, it, it's not. It's an ongoing project with an ongoing project team, typically. Think about what your support model is. Is it is it fully in-house, or is it third party? Is it partner? Is it Microsoft Direct, or is it a mix? If you're going the kind of Microsoft Direct route, what do you need in-house to support that system? Don't forget your third party components. It's no good having a, a really tight SLA on your, your link servers if you don't have a similar SLA on your gateways or on your third parties. Make sure you, you monitor. Absolutely vital. You want to look at your ongoing performance where you can improve, but also monitoring for service availability and for errors. Skype for Business is built in really robust apologies and you can actually lose servers and carry on with full service. So you want to be knowing when that happens and, and how it impacts your users and where you need to rebuild. So active monitoring, really important. And finally, lifecycle management patching. There'll be OS patches, there'll be Skype for Business Server patches, there'll be third parties. All that stuff needs to be included in your support and lifecycle management plan. Make sure you're Continuing review, uh, continually reviewing all your options uh, and looking to kind of maximize the value of your platform. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some of the requirements. I just want to take a couple of minutes to do a summary and give you all the areas to think about. So in terms of topology and migration approach, um, in the kind of old adage of a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, you need to think about which which model you're going to go down. Are you going public cloud, private cloud, or hosted or hybrid? Um, and it could be a mix of those. Think about your gateway placement in terms of your voice project and your third party components. And make sure you're considering your high availability and disaster recovery and revisiting those, those elements ever so often to check they're all lined up for your business requirements. In terms of Rollout and support. Creating a good impression is kind of the headline, but think about endpoints. This is the where the rubber meets the road. Your users are going to be using these often heavily all day, every day. Make sure you're getting the right experience for users. Make sure you cover training, user adoption, end user support. Think carefully about your, your rollout strategy and your planning and not just the day that the users go live, but also week one, week two, week three. How are you supporting them? How are you maximizing their experience? And infrastructure and support lifecycle management. Not, not a big bang project, not a fire and forget, a walk away type project. This is a, a business communications platform that needs an ongoing support model, ongoing lifecycle management, patching support and improvement. So be sure to think about your project in that term, not in a, we're going to migrate thousands of users and then we're done, we're on to the next project. That's a, a summary of the kind of high level important things I think based on a real experience of real projects. Thanks very much for, for listening. Ian's just gonna take you through a, a little bit around modality and then we're going into our question and answer. Thank you very much, Tom. Yes, obviously we wanted to keep this webinar very much informative and of value, but uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't just give you a little bit of background as to who Modality are. Hopefully many of you have heard of us. Um, we, we've got a lot of experience in this area, a lot of professionals. We have an end-to-end -end, um, offering that covers everything right from the beginning of the, the, the journey right the way through. I'm not going to read through all of this uh, detail on this slide. I'm just going to let you peruse um, to your heart's content. 
Um, but we are, um, as you'll see in the top corner there, one of the elite launch partners globally for Skype for Business, um, which um, is, is something we're very proud about. Uh, and that's probably come about is the fact that we're one of the largest dedicated uh, teams looking at Microsoft UC. Um, yes, we have services that cover from the, the early justification, helping you evaluate, uh, and not in, in some cases, it's not always right. Um, and we offer that advice as well. Um, so we can run everything through from that justification, helping you with the design, the planning, uh, implementation, adoption, and then that, that development, which Tom has already covered a little bit about. So I want to leave that there because this isn't supposed to be a sales thing. This is supposed to be an informative thing. We have had a few questions come through. Um, so I would like to ask Tom these now. Um, so first question we've got is, are there any licensing changes with Skype for Business? Uh, that's a good question. I normally avoid licensing as much as possible. Um, uh, it's uh in terms of high level it's under software assurance so it is a new product so i believe on the server side for on-prem it's a new product that if you're under software assurance you'll be having access to it um, i'm not microsoft i'm not a licensing vendor so talk to your lars and talk to microsoft in office 365 obviously as part of the rolling model that is office 365 there's no changes you'll automatically upgrade to the latest and greatest and, and you'll get that if you haven't got it already imminently between now and the end of May, I think is well that schedule. Okay, thank you very much. Next question we've got on the list here is, can you touch briefly on the high end, high end, the new video interrupt server? Uh, yeah, so um, that's quite a detailed question, but in, in Skype for Business in terms of server infrastructure, there's a new server called Viz, the video interrupt server. And that allows a, a, a selection of Tamburg, specifically Tamburg at this stage, endpoints, to be able to video communicate directly with Skype for Business Server. Uh, it's quite a nice, a nice thing if you've got a lot, bunch of Tamburg endpoints out there, as some big customers have. It's all included in the licensing in the box with Skype for Business. You will need some quite chunky servers to run it. Um, it is a subset of what you would get from a partner solutions such as Akano or Polycom. So have a, I mean, the, the documentation is already up on TechNet, but as the code becomes available, talk to us or one of the TAP partners or someone that's had some experience with it and just understand, does the Viz feature set meet your requirements or should you be leaning towards a, a partner solution, a certified partner solution, which might give you a, a fuller feature set and fuller options. Definitely a, an exciting new element for Skype for Business with this server. Okay, I think there's, there's two more comes through. Tom, quite breaking news. I'm getting these questions on IM. Um, <laughs> so, will there be a replacement to the Link 2013 mobile app to in, in coincide with Skype for Business? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, currently, the rollout is kind of staggered, as you probably guessed, for Skype for Business clients. At the moment, the desktop client is out. There will be a mobile client, um, but we don't have any detail public on that yet. Uh, there is some NDA stuff. Talk to us to get you in touch with Microsoft, or if you've got NDAs from Microsoft, if you want to talk to us offline, we can go through a bit more detail on that. Um, where can I find out more about Link Training Bots? Uh, that's a good question. That's like a bit of product placement for us. So we have a, a bunch of bots, for those that aren't aware, bots are kind of automated link agents, if you like, that can send constant content and instant messages. Uh, we have a bunch, and I'm sure one of our marketing team will be happy to send you some details on that. Uh, there's also a bunch of details on our website, modalitysystems.com. Actually, just, just to pick up, that's quite nice because that fits in. Uh, we will be covering some of those that are related to the adoption uh, process in the next webinar, which is on the 12th of May. Good stuff. Uh, was this meeting hosted on Skype for Business? Yes, it was. Uh, well, yes and no, I guess is the more honest answer. Uh, so yes, from our point of view, uh, we're actually using a third party vendor called Event Builder who work closely with Microsoft to join Skype for Business meetings and rebroadcast them to larger audiences. Uh, this is quite a nice model because it means we can scale to hundreds of participants without everybody coming direct to our Skype for Business servers. Um, and again, if you want to find out more about that approach, then uh, give us a shout. 
Uh, I've got the longest question in the world now. Uh, in your experience, where do savings come from when comparing Skype for Business with Enterprise Voice versus traditional IP telephony systems? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and the answer often is conferencing is a really big one. So if you've got a traditional IP uh, telephony system, you're probably paying for a third party conferencing provider, WebEx or BT Meet Me or something similar to that. Even when those services are kind of in the pence a minute, you'd be amazed how quickly those things add up. Um, so conferencing costs are a key one. Remember, when we're replacing a PBX with Skype for Business, we're replacing it with a full UC platform. So we're providing instant messaging presence, voice and video against probably what is just a telephony platform. So you have to consider all the benefits you're getting of that platform versus the cost of the IP PBX even when we do a kind of apples to apples for getting all the ROI on, on intermeshing and presence and working from home and everything else, often because of the way Skype for Business is licensed into various enterprise agreements and the lower cost of using commodity hardware or commodity virtualization, Skype for Business, even in a like for like replacement, often will come out cheaper or more cost effective than a traditional PBX. I think, I think it's, it's, it's important to pick up on a point you mentioned there, Tom, in the fact, because this is very much a change in the way of working. So th this facilitates different working practices. So we see a lot of customers, depending on the drive that they've got and the reason behind their journey, um, they, they experience value in different areas. Uh, we have examples where sort of travel has been reduced. Uh, we have examples where um, the time to market for various products um, or services has been improved. And that, a lot of that is down to the collaborative nature with presence, which I think is one of the key features in there and instant messaging and desktop conferencing. So all of that has all helped to bring through the value, not just in the like for like replacement of a PBX, but also because it is changing and touching so many areas of the business, it's changing that way we're working. So if, if you're interested in trying to understand where others have uh, got value from taking this approach, then again, please contact us and we will happily share some of those examples with you in a workshop. Yeah, I mean, quite often we do ROI workshops for exactly that reason. It's like, let's see if it actually adds up and it's rare it doesn't. So worth, worth spending a bit of time doing the maths on that. Uh, in terms of a couple of last questions, is there a SharePoint site template to help users yet? Uh, there's, there's been a whole bunch of stuff released by Microsoft actually in terms of training material. They haven't replicated the SharePoint site uh, method yet, but they have produced lots of videos and PowerPoint and user experience training um, to help particularly with the migration from the Link 2013 client to the Skype for Business client. Uh, the best bet is probably for us to round up those links and publish them as a blog post or similar. Um, so we'll do something like getting those out so you guys can find them on the Modality blog. I think as well, and we'll cover this in the next webinar, is, is having the assets and the content to do some of that adoption and training uh, and, and the awareness with, within the, the organization is one thing. I think it's actually putting the program of activities around it and some of those best approaches to bringing users with you is quite key as well. It's not just a bunch of training material will solve your problem. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely true. It's a good starting point, but it is a starting point. Uh, last one, I think now. Uh, will there be a new version of the Microsoft Attendant console? No, no, no plans for that. The Attendant console came out in 2010, the Microsoft one. Um, it hasn't been up upgraded or changed for Link 2013, and there's no intention to change it for Skype for Business. But there's a whole third party ecosystem around Attendant consoles now, and Microsoft are keen for the third parties to kind of thrive in that space. So the 2010 contender console will work and it is what it is, but if you real, really want attendant functionality, you want to look to one of the third parties, your, your Landis attendant console, your Compatellas, your Zcoms, those type of people who offer third party attendant consoles certified for Skype business. Okay, I think in, in the interest of time, um, I think we'll, we'll have to draw a line under that in terms of questions. There are a couple more coming in. Um, thank you, Tom, very much for, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us today. And thank you, everyone at the other end of this conference, for taking time out of your day. I hope you found it useful um, and informative. Um, let's say there are a few more, which I've, I've kept this, the slide up on the screen. There are a few more coming up in the series, so um, please uh, 
take the time to have a look to see if there's anything of interest. We're also very keen on getting your, your feedback. So if there are other things you'd like to hear about, um, other things that you feel that we could add some value in terms of talking to you knowledge-wise, um, please send us your, your information, questions, etc. There are, we can be contacted through all the normal um, ways, social media wise. There's an email address there on the screen as well, or you can contact us through the website. And there's a couple of hashtags, so just keep up with the, the news and the, the feed from this particular series. Um, again, thank you very much. Hope it's been useful, and we hope to see a lot of you on the next, next sessions. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Cheers. Bye. Bye.